The LA Clippers were without Kawhi Leonard for a second straight game and what was a big test for them against the Boston Celtics, arguably the best team in the league, and the game was over within three quarters, you can even argue two and a half quarters, as the Clippers got absolutely trounced in their worst loss of the season by a score of 145-108. to What does this say about the Clippers? How much of it is just Kawhi not being there? How can the Clippers play better without Kawhi? And man, oh man, it's time to have a conversation. Going to be talking about it all on today's Locked On Clippers. You are Locked On Clippers, your daily Los Angeles Clippers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, sir. You are locking in with the clips. Thank you for making Locked On Clippers the first listen of your day, your team every day. I'm your host, Darren Viziri, born and raised in L.A. And in my 19th season as a Clipper fan, you can also follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Dime Dropper Pod and subscribe to my own YouTube channel, Dime Dropper, where a vlog of what was, in my opinion, my least favorite game to attend this season is on my channel. Talk to fans throughout the day. And, of course, Locked On Clippers, free and available wherever you get your podcasts, including YouTube, where I want you to let me know. Does that say anything about the team? Does it say how much we need Kawhi? Are you worried about the games without Kawhi? Are you worried about Kawhi? Because in this episode, I'm going to be talking about the game, but obviously the main takeaway, before the game even started, no Kawhi Leonard missing his second straight game with the hip contusion. We all thought he was going to go, and now it's starting to cause fans, including myself, to be a little bit worried. Now, do I think it's a serious injury? No, I don't. But the fact that he's missing two straight games lets me know it is an injury. I was actually I was actually in the back of my mind kind of hoping for it to be load management because it, if he only missed one game and you know it's a back-to-back and they use the fall to be kind of like a you know insurance policy if anybody accused him of load managing like look, he took that fall. They want to just be careful with it. But two straight games. That concerns me just a tad. Now, obviously, if he comes back against Charlotte on Tuesday, then it's it's no big deal at all. But right now, it does make me a little bit concerned because those 27 straight games, it was an amazing run. If you had told me, though, 27 out of 29 games, I would have been very satisfied with it. So I'm just hoping he's back next game, and I'm still knocking. Still knocking. It was good to have Paul George back and offensively looked a lot better, but let's talk about it, right? So second game of the season without Kawhi. And it's the second straight game where we weren't even able to compete in the fourth quarter. Like, the game was already done. We waved the white flag. So, is that more about the level of competition we were facing at OKC and versus Boston? Remember, they didn't have Porzingis. It wasn't just that we didn't have Kawhi. They didn't have Porzingis, which is relevant. But I still give them the advantage. Is it about the competition? Or is it just maybe the Clippers aren't a good team without Kawhi? I'm not ready to say that they're not a good team without Kawhi because that's the whole reason we brought James Harden in, right? Or like the main reason was games without one of the two star players, we have an insurance policy. Well, it hasn't looked that way so far through two games. And you know what? Maybe I'm an optimist, but my takeaway is that those two games are too good of teams for you to make real judgments on. And plus, I just don't think you should judge any team in the NBA without their best player. Like, All these rosters financially and team construction-wise all are about how do we get the most around our best player. Yeah, some teams might be able to do better than other teams without their best. The Clippers in previous years have been a team that has been able to do that. But it's still not ideal. So I don't think it's a, a big takeaway when a team gets blown out without their best player. Like, oh, this means this about this team. Not in my opinion. Now, everyone's going to point to the 12-30 start. That 12-30 start is an excuse. The Clippers are 18-12 and 12 in the Ty Lue era with those matinee games. I'm not a fan of it. I wasn't feeling very good at the game, but I'm not playing. You know what I'm saying? It was embarrassing. The Clippers got completely outworked. Before we get into the specifics, they got completely outworked. The Celtics were first to every loose ball. Their offense was played with more purpose. And I said the same thing against OKC. Played with more purpose. The ball was moving faster. They were getting into their sets quicker. Their transition defense was better. Their defense was better, period. We were bad in transition. We were not communicating well enough. And rebounding was just a problem. The Celtics, 
got 15 offensive rebounds to our nine. And at one point of the game, I think it was in the first, by the first half, the second chance points were 14 to six in favor of the Celtics. We were allowing their backup big man that I'd never even heard of, the Portuguese guy, Keita, to get a double double. He literally got a double double, 14 and 12, six offensive rebounds. And his defense was pretty good too, not trying to take anything away from him. But that was like, you know, that's unacceptable. First quarter was the only one that the Clippers like were kind of in it. They lost it 28-21. After that, they lost every quarter. We literally gave every quarter. 28-21 in the first, 40-30 in the second, 38-30 in the third, and 39-27 in the fourth. So in three of four quarters, we allowed 38 plus points. That's never going to win you a basketball game. Let's talk about why it was so hard to defend the Boston Celtics. So we have Paul George guarding. Actually, he wasn't even guarding anyone significant. It was Amir Coffey guarding Tatum to start the game and Terrence Mann guarding Jalen Brown. First possession, Zubats is in deep drop coverage against Jalen Brown. I don't know why that's what our plan was. I mean, I think we quickly adjusted it. But deep cut, oh, actually, I know why. Because Jalen Brown's only shooting like 33 or 34% from three so far this season. So I get it, but it was a little too easy. He made that first shot. The Clippers were blitzing the ball screens with Tatum, though, when it came to Zubats. They were blitzing every time. And if Tatum can make that one pass over the top, now you're in a four-on-three situation as the offense. And when the Celtics are knocking down their threes, you know they're going to shoot a lot. If they make them, it's really hard to guard them. They're probably the best team in the league, just given their defensive personnel and their shooting. But when it's not falling, that's when they have their cold spells, and that's when you've seen some struggles for them in the playoffs at times because they really fall in love with that three ball. In this game, they shot 53 threes to the Clippers 34. So just from a math perspective, they only shot five more shots, but they shot 20, I'm sorry, 19 more threes, and they shot 47% from three. 25 for 53, eight different Celtics made a three by the first half at halftime, by halftime, and only four for the Clippers. I mean, they were just lights out. Someone like O'Shea Brissett, for example, he's only made three threes on the season. Guess how many he made in the game? Three. So it's a mixture of the Celtics had a lights out offensive game, but the Clipper defense was not good enough without Kawhi. That backline help that Kawhi gives when Zubats gets dragged out is very important. The timing of where Kawhi is and when he comes to help is great. His hands are great. He's just a disruptor. And we can't understate or overstate what that means to this defense. It truly just looks like our defense without Kawhi is terrible. Because remember, we're already thin at that front court spot. I mean, now that Amir Coffey is starting when Kawhi is out, who do we have coming off the bench? Daniel, Tice, Kobe Brown. These guys aren't necessarily big time stoppers around the basket and I want to say Paul George and James Harden being the two star players that are starting for us they need to set a better tone defensively particularly Paul George I didn't notice it when I was at the game I only noticed James Harden who I counted about 13 points that he could have been at fault for defensively I mean getting blown by on the perimeter besides like one deflection he had in a couple decent shot contests he was bad defensively he got beat back door by Drew Holiday early in the game at times in transition he wasn't sprinting back uh just you know when Derek White got the better of him at one point uh when he was guarding the pick and roll Jason Tatum blew by him super easily and drew his Vitsi Zubats which allowed Kata to get an offensive rebound and put back just a bad defensive game from James Harden and then Paul George, I didn't notice it at the arena. Then I went home and watched. He was horrible defensively outside of like a block and like a steal or two. Let me see how many steals he got. Because whatever it was, it wasn't relevant. He got one steal and two blocks. He was bad defensively, over helping when he didn't need to, not picking up in transition. There was one possession in the second quarter where Jason Tatum was wide open. Sorry, two possessions in a row. Back-to-back threes, Paul George no idea where he was supposed to be. Like, there was, he was guarding Tatum on one possession, and he's just ball-watching. I get it if you're ball-watching guarding a non-shooter or, like, the worst player on the court. You're guarding the best player on the court. Better than you, Paul George. Sorry. Wake up. Like, Paul George's offense was great. I'm not going to lie. I mean, he came out the gate aggressive, which I love to see. He had 12 points in the first quarter, 10 points in the first six minutes. He was great. But our defense 
just wasn't good enough at all from anyone. And coming up, going to be talking more about the mistakes that were made and why this game was just always out of question for the Clippers to win. 145-108. to 108. The Clippers lose this one. Going to be talking more about the specifics and the X's and O's coming up. The Locked On family and Locked On Clippers and myself wishes everybody listening a Merry Christmas. It sucks that the Clippers aren't playing on Christmas Day, but it is what it is. Before we got James Harden, there was no one really talking about us. We were flying under the radar, so we didn't get a Christmas game. So I would advise, Clipper Nation, that you take the Christmas if you celebrate it with your family. Just watch basketball. I'd always encourage you to watch basketball. Watch basketball or football, whatever it is, and just enjoy Just enjoy the games without the Clippers being involved with your family. You know what I'm saying? It's very stress-free. And enjoy the holidays more than anything. Be with people that you love. That's what it's all about. I have a family friend Christmas party on Christmas Eve and then the family one on Christmas. So I'm going to be busy with my family. And holidays are just a great time to be around people that you love. Maybe reflect on the year. And if you're lucky, exchange some gifts. Locked On wishes you a very Merry Christmas. Go Clippers. All right, Clippers losing this one 145-108. to They are now 0-2 without Kawhi Leonard. Two straight L's now after a nine-game winning streak. They are now 17-12 on the season with an 11-4 home record, which is still pretty good. Celtics shot 52% from the field in this game and 47 from three. The Clippers shot 46% from the field and 32 from three. The only bright spot in the box score for the Clippers, actually two, turnovers weren't too high, even though it felt like they were in the game. We turned the ball over 11 times. Boston turned the ball over 10 times. And then 100% from the free throw line, 15 for 15. So... I've been talking about the Clippers have recently shot much better from the foul line, and I'm happy that's that's the case because it's never a bad thing. You've got to be good at making free throws. Now, as far as the Clippers, you know, we just weren't a better team than this Celtics team. They have better point of attack defenders. They have the best player on the court in Jason Tatum, and they were lights out from three, and we just weren't hitting our threes. But also, the quality of their three-point attempts is just better, and that's because they have better defenders. I mean, look at their starting lineup. Al Horford, who's absolutely no slouch. Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, 6'7 plus athletic wings that can guard. And then the two best, arguably, guard defenders in the entire league. I'd put like Alex Caruso in that mix as well. I can't think off the top of my head at everyone, but Drew Holiday and Derek White, that's as good as it gets. Drew Holiday, perfect for guarding James Harden. Derek White can guard someone else. They had Jalen Brown guarding Paul George, and he was actually kind of struggling, and then they put Derek White on him. Derek White got a block on him from behind, trailing a screen. I mean, it was amazing. But that's the perfect personnel to guard the Clippers. And then if Kawhi was there, I would assume Jason Tatum would have to guard him. I mean, that's just great personnel for us. And Porzingis would be a, you know, whether they have Porzingis or Horford, they have a pick-and-pop threat big, two two of them. The Celtics roster, they have the best six-man rotation I think in the league six men Pritchard and Hauser are good players but I'm not fully sold on saying like they got the best seven and eight man rotation in the league but Hauser can really shoot the ball I mean there's no doubt about that even though he was only one for five from three in the game Peyton Pritchard was three for five from three though he came in and started lighting it up but I thought the Clippers defense just attention to detail was just not good enough one thing that the Celtics did that was very interesting was they put Jason Tatum on zoo because we obviously like to use Zoo as a screener with Harden, so then they can switch that pick and roll. And then they had Horford guarding Terrence. So when they wanted to put Horford in the pick and roll, Clippers, which we want to do because you always want to put their slow-footed bigs in the pick and roll, Horford, for the most part, was just showing and sometimes not even recovering because right now Terrence Mann, teams know that he's not playing well, he's not shooting well, so they're okay with letting him get the ball. And I'll talk about him more later in the third segment. But I will say one of the only silver linings was that James Harden, even after having a bad first quarter offensively, like several turnovers, just wasn't getting good shots, wasn't making shots. He had a stretch in the beginning of the second quarter where he made two threes, he got 
uh, made two layups on a fast break against Al Horford. And he actually blew by Tatum once. He blew by Drew Holiday once for a Zubats lob. And he blew by Horford twice. So James Harden is starting to look better in terms of getting by guys, which we're going to need if we want to win a championship with him in the playoffs. Will he be able to do it consistently after all these months? You know, I know the season takes a toll on James Harden at times. It, it, sh- it has shown that it has over the years, especially with how much he's been asked to do over the years. But I'm hoping that because he's not being asked to do as much as he did, even with Philly and, of course, with Houston, that he'll have the legs to still be able to blow by even the elites of the elites because his handle is still elite of the elite. But I-, I wasn't a fan of James Harden's performance in this game. His stats might tell you 14 points, 9 assists, on 6 for 13 shooting and 2 for 5 from 3, but he got no free throw attempts. He probably should have gotten two. There was one possession in the second quarter, like right when we kind of fell apart, where Harden missed like two point-blank shots around like the key, and then that was right before Jason Tatum had those two threes, and then he had a four-point play when Kobe Brown had one of his many reckless closeouts this season. How many times have I talked about Kobe Brown fouling jump shooters? He clearly has got to relax. We fouled Jason Tatum three times on threes throughout the game. That's unacceptable. Just so just a lack of attention to detail, a lack of effort. I mean, Brian Seaman even said it in commentary that the Clippers don't, they look like they're in third gear. Like they just don't look like they came out sharp at all. Whereas Boston looked like they were. And there was a lot of Celtics fans in the building. 55% to 60%. It was crazy. There's a reason I don't go to Celtics Clipper games. It raises my blood pressure too much. And we had nothing to cheer about. Nothing. It's disappointing. You know, Russ comes in, and he's guarding Jason Tatum. And I have to say, we had terrible endings to the first and second quarter. First quarter, Russell Westbrook, two bad shots in a row. One no-pass possession, the other one a three when he could have attacked a closeout. Bad. Russ in the first half was terrible. Norman Powell in the first half, terrible. And when Norm's not hitting shots, his lack of defense sticks out. Now, granted, Norm is going to get a pass from me because he's been playing really well lately, and it's just a ma- you know he's a role player. He's going to have a bad shooting game eventually. Three for nine from the field, one for three from deep, seven points in 25 minutes. Yeah, he wasn't good. Kobe Brown, despite his bad closeouts and his defense not being that great, six points, four assists, two rebounds. He had a really nice pass to Ivica Zubac in the third quarter on – I'm sorry, the second quarter on two for two shooting, and both his shots were threes. So that's good. You know, get some confidence for Kobe Brown shooting the ball potentially. But Amir Coffey had two points. Terrence Mann had zero points. I mean, it was no good. That's two starters, by the way, combining for two points. The only players I thought were, you can argue, played well in this game. Zubats and Paul George. But after watching Paul George's tape defensively, I'm not, I don't know if I can say he played well just because he had 22 points. Like, that's not good. Or 21 points. 21 points, 3 rebounds, 2 assists, a steal, and 2 blocks. He was efficient. 9 for 17 from the field, 3 for 7 from 3. Harden, by the way, I think he should have had 5 turnovers. There was one that he wasn't given, but like Terrence Mann, they were doubling off of him, and it was early in the game. It was only 5 to 5, so Terrence hadn't really, you know, missed everything all of a sudden, and he didn't pass to him, and it ended up being a turnover, and that was, I thought, you know, a selfish decision by Harden on that play. He should have given up the ball, but I mean... It's hard for me to say anybody was good. It was just a disaster of a performance. The Celtics were rolling on all cylinders. And for how bad the Clippers were, we've got to talk about how good the Celtics were. I mean, four guys with 18 or more points. You had 18 from Derek White, 20 from Drew Holiday, 24 from Jalen Brown, and 30 from Tatum. Tatum was 9 for 16 from the field, 5 for 10 from 3. And Drew Holiday was 8 for 12 from the field and 4 for 6 from 3. And Jalen Brown was 9 for 17 from the field and 3 for 6 from 3. They were just absolutely lights out. And on the topic of the ending the second quarter poorly, we actually cut the game down to 15. And then Paul George shoots a quick 3 trying to get the 2 for 1 with way too much time on the shot clock. And Jalen Brown comes in and actually gets the two for one. And then they're the ones that end up with the solid ending to the quarter and not us. Just terrible. Bad decision making. All the way around. Unserious. Without Kawhi, you have to look better than that. You have to put up a fight. You can't lose by 40 at home. I don't care how good Boston is. Does it say anything about the team with Kawhi? No. But it does say that maybe without Kawhi, we're not even that good. 
in my opinion, it's just a level of competition. But the sample size of two games, they're not very good without Kawhi right now, especially defensively. Come on. And coming up, going to be talking about a big reason why the Clippers have been struggling even more in these two games. Clippers losing this one 145 to 108 against the Boston Celtics. In this game, we had the peak of Terrence Mann's struggles. It's getting really bad, man. It's getting really bad. Terrence was 0 for 10 in this game. 0 for 6 from 3. He was a game worst. Minus 33. Actually, no, Harden was a game worst. Minus 34. Terrence, but Harden was better than Mann. Terrence was minus 33 with a donut. Four rebounds, three assists on 0 for 10 shooting. After he missed his first two threes that were well short, he didn't even want any part of the shot. He was looking straight to pass after James Harden gave him the ball, even on those short roll, on those pick and pop situations. It's hurting our offense without Kawhi. It was Kawhi so good that we can get around it with him. But Terrence, this is not the Terrence man that I know. This is not the Terrence man that we've come to know. Everybody that's a stand of Westbrook or Harden just thinks that it's only one playoff game. That, that's why we like Terrence Mann so much. And that's not true at all. Game 7 against Dallas, he was great. Game 5 against Utah, he was great. Last year, we were all clamoring for more minutes because he deserved them. He was better than Batum last year. Everyone's like, oh my God, I can't believe they traded Batum. That's such hindsight. Batum looked washed last year. Terrence Mann was definitely better than him. So people that don't know T and don't know that his route and his story and his ups and downs with the Clippers, they don't know and they might not have as much sympathy. But if Terrence doesn't step it up soon and get that confidence back, because it's all confidence. I can see an unconfident player from a mile away. He's not looking at the basket after he misses two shots. It's And you can see the reaction every time he misses. It's wearing on him. His misses were bad. In the beginning of the season, it was he's not missing bad. He doesn't have bad misses. Now he's missing horribly. He missed long and didn't even hit the rim at one point. And so did Paul George, by the way. Which when that's when I when I saw Paul George miss like that in the third quarter, I knew it was done. And we couldn't guard without fouling, and the Celtics were getting every call. Not to say that that made any difference, but I think it made a difference between a 30-point loss and a 40-point loss. They were struggling, they were giving him every bump, everything. But yeah, I mean, there were some moments we could have tried to get back in the game. I mean, we went down 78-53 in the third quarter, but we responded with a 7-0 run. And then Zubats had that crucial turnover when Drew Holiday picked the ball off from him in the backcourt and hit a three. And I knew right then and there, like we, were, we had no chance of coming back because we had to get it within 15-13, and we didn't. Celtics, by the way, when Daniel Tice was in, they switched one through five, and they had no problems with it. And I thought Daniel Tice in this game, he had a struggle. Like he just, he was trying, but he had no presence defensively. Teams know that he's not a rim protector because he's small. So they'll go at him at, with no problems. T Jason Tatum threw it down on his head after he spun off of Kobe Brown in the left corner. And then there were just times where, you know, I didn't know what we were doing with Daniel Tice defensively. Are we hedging the screens? Are we blitzing the screens? It felt like we were throwing two on the ball and the Celtics were just making all the right passes and hitting open threes. But I just have nothing good to say about Daniel Tice for once because he's been so good with us. He played 21 minutes. Somehow he was 5 for 5 with 15 points. I have no no recollection of any shots that he made. <laughs> Actually, I think he had no, he had a lob from Harden. I think Harden fed him a couple times, but not much. And Westbrook, I mean, he he came in the game in the second half when we were down 30 and he had a really good ending to the third quarter. He had 12 points, 5 rebounds and 5 assists and a block and only one turnover in the game, which was when he stepped out of bounds. But he was 4 for 11 from the field. And when he was sharing the court with Harden, even though it wasn't horrific, it was just, you know, Russ off the ball, catching the ball, and just being in scorer mode. And I just don't think Russ as, an, as a shooting guard kind of thing is very conducive to getting the most out of him, which is why I think limiting him and Harden's minutes together is a good thing. But, yeah. Brandon Boston got some garbage minutes. He had 13 points on 3 for 6 shooting and 1 for 4 from 3. So that was good to see. But... I mean, between Amir Coffey being really non-aggressive and only playing 17 minutes, he went 1 for 3 and was 0 for 1 from 3, and Terrence Mann being 0 for 10, we got nothing. I mean, our role players weren't good enough, but our stars just didn't set the tone defensively. Just felt like the Clippers didn't even wake up for the game. 
And that's unacceptable because they've been pretty good effort-wise this season for the most part. And this, that's, I've said the Clippers are taking the regular season seriously, but my second segment topic was unserious. But as far as Terrence Mann, I've heard a lot of people, mainly stands. It feels like Clipper fans are standing behind him. The player fans obviously are going to hate on him because they don't, they think he's ass because they just got here less than a year ago. And, you know, they're all only worried about their favorite player. But Terrence Mann, I am not going to give up on him 30 games into a season when his role has fluctuated every single second that he's been a Clipper. And now he finally has a consistent role and he's struggling because he can't make a shot right now and his confidence is hurt. Let me ask you this, Clipper Nation. Do you think that playing a slower half-court pace has hurt Terrence Mann? And I'm not, please don't make it seem like I'm blaming James Harden for that. I'm just saying that with James Harden, we play a different pace. That doesn't give him an excuse. He still has to make shots. But if you remember and know Terrence Mann's game, he loves to get up and down. You need to get him downhill a little bit because he's really good in transition. And I was looking back, and he only has had a couple of baskets recently over the last couple of weeks, and several of them have been in those transition moments, but we're not creating enough of them, and that comes from getting stops and forcing turnovers. And by the way, defensively, when he was guarding Jason Tatum, it was not planned, but on a switch or cross-matched, Jason Tatum was turning around right over him. Tatum is a tough customer, there's no doubt. He always gives the Clippers work, it seems. But Terrence, I'm not worried about the defensive side of stuff, but he needs to be better offensively because in the games that we don't have Kawhi, it sticks out majorly, and it also makes Harden and Paul George's life tougher. I don't think Harden missed a bunch of shots because of Terrence Mann, because I saw him get to the lane, and he just missed shots because the defense was better, and he just didn't have as good of a shooting game. But it still does make life harder for Harden. Absolutely does. And Paul George. So I'm still standing by Terrence. I saw some Russ fans saying we need to put Russ back in the starting lineup, which is ridiculous. So go back to the starting lineup that we were 0-5 with, as opposed to the one that we were 14-3 and with, because Russ is better than man. Russ is better than man. We know this. But it's not about him being better. Terrence being worse is why he's there. Less is more for that starting lineup. And, and by the way, we're not, we should not change the starting lineup um, until we... Maybe when without Kawhi, we throw Norman there for some more scoring. But when Kawhi comes back, we should keep the same lineup that we were 14-3 and three with. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Russ fans, I love you. But the, your answer to everything is just give Russ more minutes. That's your answer to everything. I, you know, I heard Harden fans talking as well about how bad Terrence Mann is and this and that. Like, you guys don't know him. You don't know his game. You think you do, but it's not the same when you watch every single game of his career like we have. So... I'm only defending Terrence Mann in the sense that we need to give him time. I get if people are over it and stuff, but for everything he's done for the franchise and, and how much his role has fluctuated over the years, you want to just give up on him? That's not my style, especially when we're 17 and 12 and we're not in a panic situation. That loss was bad, but we didn't have Kawhi Leonard. And I just hope he comes back soon because without him, we might struggle. But let me say this. If we don't beat Charlotte with or without Kawhi, then we can start talking. But... We should, beat him. we should beat Charlotte without Kawhi, absolutely without Kawhi, because they don't have LaMelo Ball. Even with LaMelo Ball, we should beat them without Kawhi, but they don't, so we should win. Clippers lose 145-108 to 108 to the Boston Celtics. And yeah, that was about it. Bad endings to quarters, guys. Gotta be much... It was the same against OKC. The endings to quarters weren't good. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Dime Dropper Pod. Subscribe to my own YouTube channel, Dime Dropper, for even more Clipper content and LA sports content. And Locked On Clippers, free and available wherever you get your podcasts. Let me know what you think of the game, what my comments. Of course, I know there's going to be people that are saying that I'm too soft on Terrence. That's fine. You have favorite players, and I have mine. And I have one because he's drafted here, and he gave us the big. He gave me the second best night of my life, and one of the best, if not the best, as a sports fan. So. Of course, I'm going to be indebted to him and have more patience. But I genuinely think that this is not who he is because I've seen three years of knowing who he is and now this outlier situation. So, of course, I'm going to go with that. And guys don't just regress at 27 without some major injury or something, which makes me think, is the ankle bothering you? I don't know because I've seen tendencies of hesitation before the ankle. So that's an excuse to me. He's got to be better. There's no way around it. I love you, Terrence. I hope if you listen or if your family listens, I love you. And I trust that you can be better, but you know you have to be. I know he practices. I just want to see some shots go in for him, and hopefully we can get out and run a little more. Maybe he should play in the second unit with Russ for more transition ball. Maybe. I don't know. Let me know what you think. Have a very Merry Christmas. I love you all, even the ones that annoy me. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for listening. Thank you for helping the algorithms and just making my work worth it. 
I love the Clippers. I love you. I love Clipper Nation. Greatest fans in the world. The age-old problem continues. Go Clippers. Ah... Uh...